Mac, I'm gonna ask you a question now. Uh, how do you see Wiki working with and enhancing what you do? I don't know, you know, I'm still thinking about that. It's, it's, it's like, that's, that's the question that's really, uh, you know, come out of this uh, for me this week and I, I don't have an answer yet. But um, I'm definitely I'm definitely thinking about it because there's just so many applications there and not to, you know, turn it into a thing. But I know a lot of people, surprisingly, when I was just talking about this on Twitter, a lot of people were like, yeah, I love going in Wiki and making changes. And actually my son, he's a 17, he was like, yeah, I make Wiki changes. And I was like, you do? He was like, yeah, totally, dad, come on. Like, you know, I didn't know that was just a thing people just do. So, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't think I had the authority to just go in and make a change. But that's really cool to me because it means that, you know, we really can tell our story and open it up for debate. I think a huge issue that we have in protest culture is that people don't talk to each other on the other side or outside of their own ideologies. So in, in Wikipedia, it forces that conversation in a non-confrontational manner-ish, less confrontational manner, at least an intelligent uh, confrontational manner to have the, that information really, you know, stand up in its own legs. And I think that's extra important when you're, you know, in a fight for truth. One thing I'm going to insert this this quote from Alexander Lockett real quick um, because she couldn't be here, but she Sorry. said in her chapter, uh, Wikipedia serves as a subtle but powerful form of information warfare against colonized populations. And I think that is, that was so, I, I just, you know, of course, like me with my highlighter on her chapter, um, but I think that that's just so important to consider as, you know, activism that, you know, Wikipedia, editing Wikipedia is a radical, radical act and uh, I gotta love your son being like, yeah, dad, you know, cause I, I get that all the time from my, my daughter. Uh, so goodness, teenagers, but um, we didn't know, we didn't have those things, you know, growing up, we, of course the internet and, and news that was, those weren't things that we had the authority to interact with, but now um, kids online, I guess, everything's editable to them and thank goodness that they're more comfortable and more confident sharing that that information and we can have them do more meaningful things um, to really break down those barriers. You know, several of you have brought up uh, Dr. Lockett in your chats, uh, Alexandria Lockett. Um, and I just I just want to take a moment to say uh, how much we miss her here. Uh, she was due to a unforeseen uh, major uh, personal event. She wasn't able to join us today. Uh, so our, our hearts are with her and we really look forward to doing an interview or something like that uh, in the future with her at a better time. Uh, if you're, if you want to follow this uh, YouTube channel or follow me on Twitter, I'm sure that we'll probably have an announcement about something like that in the future. So uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat coming up yet. So feel free to keep throwing them out there until we hear from our audience. I would like to know from Mr. Cunningham, um, what was going through your mind when you were just like, got an idea? Like, what were you doing? What was going, like, what, was there anything special going on? Were you like trying to solve something else or was this just something that you always wanted to do? Cause I know myself as a person who like dabbles in code, I'm not really a developer by any means, but I've always thought of like, I need a system that will help me, you know, like a computer system that I could like imagine that would help me like, you know, take all my th thoughts and put it in one place. And pretty much it would just be Wikipedia. Like, so what was it that sparked that, I guess that, 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 that moment for you? There were two sparks. One was uh, falling in love with HyperCard and having an experience there. And then the internet, when it was finally in my fingertips, I said, I want to take what I had on HyperCard and put it on the internet. They're both hypertext, but one is pictures, the other is text. But I just, I, I knew what I wanted and I didn't think it was far away and it turned out to not be far away. But when I felt it, I said, yes, that is it. So, so uh, yeah. just, just to break in, I think we may have some people here uh, who've never experienced HyperCard. Can you just say a couple words about what oh, that is? Well, HyperCard, you know, when, when, when a Macintosh had a screen this big about the size of an index card, 
HyperCard was a program where you could paint on that and have a stack of cards and flip them and this, that, and the other. And it just really matched with that size of the thing. And uh, it was... Uh, it was a content authoring system that uh, had a simple but powerful model. Now, because I like things that compute, and I spent a lot of time roaming around the university finding calculator labs, and oh, they had these cool calculators, and they could do six instructions, and I'd try to figure out what could I do with that calculator that nobody else had thought of. So, so HyperCard, I still had that, you know, uh, kind of, uh, uh, what, do you, what, what do you call it, tinkerer's interest in it. I said, well, this, what does it want to do? And it was that, what does it want to do? And I said, well, I need, I need some sort of database problem that doesn't fit into rows and columns. And, and you know, I worked in a lab and we were always worried about who, why people would or wouldn't pay attention to ideas that came out of our research lab. And I just had this feeling that engineers are very conservative and they won't use an idea unless they've seen it work before. So I wanted to track that flow. So that was, uh, hey, that's the kind of thing I could do with this HyperCard because it fits what HyperCard wants to do. So in a sense, the designers of HyperCard taught me how to think about hypertext. And once I saw it work and I, couldn't chase these people away from my desk. I want my computer back. I, you know, that uh, that I, that I knew that I had uh, reached into something that was very deep. Yeah, we actually have a follow up question from an audience member. This is from David, who was actually a uh, a, a student in my writing Wikipedia articles course several years ago, um, and he's wondering, Ward, what do you think about Lotus Notes or Domino, uh, which is another software by Ray Ozzy? and is a platform inspired by Plato notes. Uh, and he mentions collaboration, groupware, and he says it was the first NoSQL database. Oh, Plato, Plato is awesome. And in fact, I had an opportunity to, uh, oh, maybe 10 years ago, long after Plato had come and gone to, to read some of the reflections and people who were there because they, they, had, uh, they had taken the computer which lived in the world of uh, uh, researchers at a university. The university you would do research on a computer and they say, well, let's make this be something that's just available in every, in every room, a very classroom, whatever. They, 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 had, they had done that thinking it was an educational tool, but then the people using it said, well, let's make a chat program. And I don't think anybody had ever done a chat program before, but they made it in, and Ray, I think, was there doing it. Maybe he wrote it, but but Ray Ozzy knew what that feeling was like there at University of Illinois. And so then he, on a PC, just says, well, let me recreate that experience. If there's a common message, it's just if you feel something and it touches you deeply in the way you interact with the machine, then there's something in that machine that's worth duplicating. I just okay. wanted to add this, Pete, while I was here and work, just so I have it. I don't know if we can see this. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's turning me back. Yeah, it's just, yeah. It's, yeah it's oh, there you oh, look yeah, at that's that. It. That's it. Oh, it's a bigger than average one, though. Yeah. They were the, smaller when they were new. Yeah. I think <laughs> Excellent. Have that. A, a plus for the visual display. Yeah, I, I feel, like, I feel like we're sort of, you know, we got the Mr. Rogers thing going on here where we're picking stuff up off our off our desk to show to the camera. Listen, my background is from uh, from Wikimedia Commons. So excellent. Yeah, and I saw your comment. Uh, it's from Arkan Fung, who is uh, a friend of Wikipedia as well. Is a, uh, a professor at Harvard. Uh, he's yeah. done some good work around transparency. It's very cool. Um, we. So we're, we've got some questions coming in now. Um, and I just want to mention to our Zoom participants, we actually, there's a separate, separate from the chat, there's a Q&A feature. So we have one person who's asked a question there. It's a little easier for us to manage if you can ask questions using Q&A. You're welcome to ask them in the chat too, but, um, but I would prefer the, the Q&A. So we'll start off with one from there. Uh, and this one is from London Jack Books, who I know as a, uh, a dedicated wiki source editor. 
Uh, I believe also also a Wikipedia and also, you know, many of us work on many related sites, but Wikisource is a project for uh, republishing classic public domain uh, texts and, uh, and making them more accessible. So she asks, Mac, uh, you began a comment stressing the importance of knowing how to tell your story. Uh, and she would be very interested to hear more on this subject if you care to elaborate or if you could be directed to some other source that addresses, addresses that issue. I, th I think that, um, you know, and, and, and when I say my story, I mean our story, like our story as like a city and as a people here in Portland. Um, I don't, I can't say that I know full on how to tell our story. I definitely can't say that, but I know that it has to be told in more than alt magazines. And it can't just be told in on Twitter. And it can't just be told on people's you know medium accounts. Um, if we're not able to access you know the halls of power uh, through the media, you know through the New York Times or whatever, and we have been able to crack a bit of that. Um, but if we're not able to to really uh, tell our stories in those ways, what other ways are available to us? If we have sources and information, what other ways are you know are there to tell our stories? So really, sometimes it becomes a matter of trying to elevate something enough that the press becomes, you know, reputable. Perhaps that's the answer. Perhaps we have to elevate some a sort of independent or black press that becomes something that is acceptable to, you know, the larger powers that allow us to then break into the spaces like Wikipedia or wherever else or the AP or whatever it is. So, you know, we've seen it in the past, we've seen far less, you know, uh, quality papers break in with the daily caller and things like that. So it's, it just it becomes a matter of being reputable and being a consistent and making sure that, you know, again, that we are a, a following values that can be understood. Yeah. So it's, it's always a work I, in progress. I actually, I'd, I'd like to jump in. I've got a little, little anecdote uh, that really relates to that question. Um, in 2011, uh, this was, I think this was after I had left, but, um, but I, I, after I'd left the Wikimedia Foundation, I'd worked there for about a year or two. Um, but every year, every year, at least pre-COVID, uh, the Wiki, Wikimedia community has a big annual conference somewhere else in the, you know, it's, every year it's somewhere else in the world. And so that year it was in 2011. I mean, I'm mean, sorry, <laughs> in 2011, it was in Israel. Um, and of course, it, you know, we knew uh, those of us working at the foundation, many people were very aware that was something that was going to be problematic in our community, because what it means is that an enormous chunk of our community, especially an enormous chunk that we really want to be making better contact with and building bridges with, simply cannot attend because there are so many Muslim countries that do not have the ability, people do not have the ability to travel to Israel. They can't get a visa. Uh, if they could get a visa, it would be an incredibly stressful experience just going through the airport security, et cetera. So um, the then executive director of Wikimedia, Sue Gardner uh, organized just, she did this in her personal capacity, but I think it was as sort of a nod to that issue. She organized a, a tour to the West Bank after the conference was done. And so I think about 20 of us went on like a two or three day tour of the West Bank. Now they, the, the tour guides, I think were, were really sharp and sort of recognized the opportunity they had with us uh, that they could get some pretty impressive people to talk with us because they had Wikipedia visiting them. It was a little bit awkward for us because we aren't reporters, you know, but they were sort of treating us as if we were a delegation from like CNN or the BBC or something, right? We got to meet with the, the head of IT of the Palestinian Authority for several hours, the, uh, the mayor of Janine for, or I'm sorry, Jericho for several hours, uh, not his staff, you know, not like a quick little meet and greet, but like an in-depth conversation, plus a number of cultural uh, places. And the one thing, I know there's a long preamble, but this is really what stood out so strongly to me in that instance was that in three days of being there, the thing that I learned about the Palestinian people that I met is that these are people who know how to tell their story. They know that they are up against uh, an information machine in the Israeli government and in all of the, you know, that, they, that the world tends to hear their story mediated by their adversary, right? And if they 
want their story to get out to the world, they have to kind of package it up in a way that's easier for people like us to understand. They have to be good tell storytellers. They have to be compelling. They have to use examples that land for us, you know? And so that's sort of the thing. It's like, that's very different, I feel, than a lot of what I see out of the Black Lives Matter movement here, which is much younger, you know, is much, I mean, not, not just the age of the individuals, but like in terms of a movement, the Palestinian Israeli conflict has been going on for, you know, many, many decades, uh, centuries even. Uh, and, you know, so that, that I think is, is maybe one of the big differences there. Anyway, that's, I just took a lot of time with that. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to jump to another question here. Um, Can I follow up with Mac real quick, actually? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, don't mean to take much time, but um, Mac, I want to know, because um, I know oral histories are something that I am passionate about, including on Wikipedia, and I enjoyed some of the oral histories getting to digest those um, at um, the San Francisco Public Library when I was there several years ago um, that were from the civil rights movement. Do you find that oral histories... Um, you know, personal accounts, experiences of um, these times will be beneficial to include on places like Wikipedia to help tell those, tell stories and tell the story. That was, was this for Mac again? Yeah. Seems Mac, frozen. any further? Uh, yeah, it looks like we've maybe lost Mac for a moment. I'm going to hope that he heard your question, and if he unfreezes, he can jump back in. Um, sure. For the, for the moment, why don't we why don't we move on? Uh, Eric, uh, who comes to us from the Federated Wiki community, um, is asking. I think I think Lane and Robert. I think the two of you were talking about this a bit. Uh, maybe maybe someone wants to elaborate a bit more. He says, "Can any of you speak to how you see people learning how to make the transition from Wikipedia Vandal to Wikipedia Contributor?" And how does the community learn how to help people make that transition? And I'd say this question is for any of you that want to jump in. I think uh, most of us have some experience with that. Well, Lane, Lane is the one who admitted it. <laughs> yeah. Well, a, a lot of people, their, their first edit on Wikipedia is what we generously call a test edit, which means they put just, they click the edit button and put whatever they feel like into the article. These are, there's different ways for the wiki reviewers to detect this, revert it, put it back to the way it was before, and send the person who did the test edit, or perhaps vandalism, a welcome message. Said, hey, a real human saw what you did. You're actually welcome to contribute constructively to Wikipedia. Why don't you, why don't you come talk to us? And so in this way, vandalism isn't a problem for Wikipedia. It's actually a channel for recruitment. Someone can start as a vandal or doing whatever whatever they think, and they're gonna they're gonna think, okay, a human saw what I did. Uh, people notice me, and maybe the person isn't gonna come back a few minutes later and edit. Maybe they're gonna actually keep vandalizing until they also have the experience of being blocked. Like, how much can I vandalize before I get blocked? And the answer is three times. <laughs> uh, but whatever the case may be. After that happens, even if somebody's blocked, if someone were to ask them a month later, a year later, five years later, have you ed ever edited Wikipedia? That person's going to say yes. They're going to have a memory of having edited Wikipedia. They're also going to know how it works. They're going to be able to explain how it works. And they're going to say, those Wikipedia reviewers, they watch everything that you do. And it can happen that the vandal then creates a new account, maybe discards their old identity. Why mention it? and then does something constructive in the future. There's a lot of people who have this story on Wikipedia. Yeah, great, thank you. All right, so, uh, so here's a, a bit more of a media theory question. Uh, Laura, Laura Miller, who I, I happen to know worked at one time for the Center for Media and Democracy, so has a, a, a pretty interesting view on, on the way that different media platforms and organizations interact. Uh, Laura asks, since Wikipedia began, the internet has developed quite a bit. Thinking about the rise of social media, has it had an impact on Wikipedia or has Wikipedia had an impact on social media? Or do these two phenomena not really inform each other? I'll offer the answer that, uh, uh, that social media has discovered the algorithm 
and give an algorithm a bad name. You know, I, uh, I was a computer programmer. I was very proud of algorithms, but uh, uh, that, that is a tool of a different business model. And Wikipedia has uh, flirted once, I understand, with uh, advertising, and it uh, was... Uh, uh, corrected immediately that it that it that it's it, that it's a different model of funding, and I think that makes them uh, uh, completely different animals. Uh, there is a user-generated content element of that, but uh, no, it's 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 completely different. I don't know if ever other other panelists agree with that. I think that I think the observation about algorithms is a really uh, a really important one. I actually I. I um... Put together a, a, a piece for the Miss Infocon blog uh, a, a year or so ago about what the the title was. What how has Wikipedia dodged the scrutiny or the the I don't remember the word I used the the challenges that social media have from government regulators, and that was really that was kind of the number one. You know, I, I explored like several different dimensions to it, but that was the main one. Is that uh, you know when Twitter and Facebook and YouTube get into the business of trying to anticipate what you want to see and weighting certain things a little more heavily or, you know, moving things in or out of your feed according to what they learn about you. Um, yes, it helps them do stuff that can be good for their business in terms of making a feed that's more interesting to you and that allows them to sort of capture you in their world and, and stay relevant and interesting, but they're also exerting tremendous influence over what you learn. And Wikipedia has always tried to, it just doesn't get into that business. Wikipedia makes no effort to present a, a, a feed or a stream. It encourages you to chart your own path. And I do think that's a, that's a huge difference in just the fundamental way that they're structured is Wikipedia puts those decisions in the hands of the reader themselves, uh, rather than trying to make those decisions for them. I, I agree with that, Pete, and, and with Ward, wanted to so underscore that, say that social media taken as a whole does look like the evil anti-Wikipedia, um, because it eventually, it, it, as you said, its aim is to sort of shrink your worldview, as opposed to Wikipedia's uh, aim, which is to expand your worldview. I think the other thing that is worth mentioning about social media is uh, perhaps uh, getting this generation, I think as Mac and Jackie said, to be comfortable being instant content creators. That they came to a blank slate, oh, what's this, you know, Instagram, oh, I see it doesn't have anything, I, you know. Uh, Oh, I have to bring my own followers to Kickstarter, you know, wh whatever it is. Uh, the idea that it, it, these are just platforms, you have to do it. Uh, and then finally, what, what Lane said uh, uh, about someone being there and correcting you from being a vandal, you can be a jerk on social media and there is no, there is no uh, sort of friendly, you know, course correction, right? In fact, there, there may be a celebration of behavior that's not good. Um, so it's, I think those three, three things are worth mentioning. All right, great. Uh, we have uh, another question. This is from Robin Weiss. And Robin asks this, I think, could go for anyone. I'm going to ask Sherry if maybe she wants to take this. I think uh, you may be the only one who hasn't spoken up in the Q&A session yet. Um, what was the first article you remember editing? Uh, um, yeah, and, and is there a story around it? I wrote about um, my, uh, someone that I know um, who, uh, you know, she was the first, um, uh, one, of, one of the first um, women in the uh, diplomatic corps um, she was an ambassador to Madagascar. I believe she was the first Black woman who was an ambassador to Madagascar. And um, she has, also has a connection with Gloria Steinem. Um, she worked at a, um, I believe, um, I, I don't have the article that I have right in front of me, but I believe that it was um, uh, in New York. And um, 
she was one of the only black women working at that company where Gloria Steinem um, spoke about, um, uh, came to the company and spoke to the women of the company. Um, and she had actually invited Gloria to come in her position as um, a junior executive, uh, account executive at the time. It was back in the late 60s. And so she just has an amazing story and she's done a whole bunch of other stuff. This is just the, the tip of the iceberg, but um, she's just someone I happen to know of. And uh, I thought that she deserved a Wikipedia article. So that was my first one. Okay. Uh, so um, I think if anyone else wants to jump in on that, feel free. Also, Mac, uh, I don't know if you, I, th I think Jackie had directed a question to you earlier uh, and we had some tech issues. So if you wanted to jump back on that, you're welcome to. I would have to be reminded what the question was because I was trying to be heard and I got cut off. Gotcha. <laughs> Uh, well, if you have, we have a moment, um, I was asking about oral histories, because oral histories is something that um, some of us are really excited to include on Wikipedia because people can can tell their own story. And I'm um, an ethnographer. I love hearing stories uh, of people and their own experience. And uh, when I was in San Francisco a few years ago, I loved going through and listening to some of the oral histories uh, of people from the civil rights and disability rights movement. Um, do you find that you were talking about telling stories? Do you find that uh, sharing personal accounts uh, would be helpful in a, as a way to tell the stories of activism? I'm actually happy that we came back to that question now instead of answering it the first time, because I've heard more and I thought about it a little bit more. Um, I think that, um, Having people be able to do that could be helpful, but it could also be like extremely distracting and also just kind of muddying. And I think that one of the things that makes a wiki so amazing is that it's not a news source. It's not a, it's not really an information source. It's a place that people can go and get information, but it's not the source, right? It's just a place that has, has fleshed out the sources. So to kind of add in like, source information, I think it muddies the water and it actually kind of puts it into that a social media boat that Pete was just uh, talking about how how not how it's user content, but it's not just like a branding content. Because that's what that kind of uh, uh, lends into when you start having original content is it turns it from, you know, Wikipedia to Netflix, you know, and all of a sudden you've got a different thing going on. Great. Uh, so yeah, so Sherry, I'd love I'd love to hear your follow up. I just want to mention, like, I think after that, I think we've got a great question to close on. So I just want to let you guys let this rattle around in your head. Uh, someone is asking, someone anonymous is asking, quite appropriately. There's so much anonymity in Wikipedia. Is asking Wikipedia at 25, or actually it's at 20. How would you measure its success? So maybe you, if you can think of a couple word answer for that, we'll come back to that after Sherry. I just want to um, uh, uh, jump on the last question with oral history. Um, Africat actually ran an oral history uh, uh, project with Columbia University. They have a um, an MA in uh, in oral oral history. Uh, oh, it's, um, the Columbia History Oral History Masters program. And so, in 2017, we got together with them. And uh, we, um, we, for the next two years, we uh, worked with them on getting oral knowledge um, on Wikipedia. We had what's called a recordathon, which is to um, exactly what it sounds like. It's a Wikipedia edit-a-thon, except uh, with the added uh, oral knowledge component. And so we had um, people come and talk about um, their uh, you know, uh, for example, we had people and come and give short tidbits of oral knowledge on their uh, passage as immigrants to the country. Um, and uh, so our concept was that it would accompany articles on Wikipedia, because right now you can't use oral knowledge as, um, as a standalone device on Wiki. But we're hoping that in the future, oral knowledge, as, as it is considered in many parts of the world, especially the global south, 
that it will be um, considered part and parcel with um, oral knowledge, um, with uh, written knowledge that is accepted in um, in majority Western countries. So uh, that's actually an avenue that uh, that hopefully will open up in the future. All right. Thank you. All right, so uh, so let's let's try to wrap this up in about the next two minutes or so. Uh, who's who's got a thought about how do we measure twenty years of Wikipedia? How do we know whether that's a success or not? Lane, Ward, Ward speaking, but he's muted. Oh, yeah. All right. I, uh, well, now I got to really be intelligent. Uh, now I was going to say, you know. Uh, what I'm most proud of Wikipedia is its effort to be diverse, and I know that's a long road, but I think if it is as, a, as important to all people in the world as it is for uh, white men in America, that that would, be, that would be enough. It doesn't have to be better for me, it's already fabulous, but to be there for everybody in as it's promised every language so so that's 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 how i would judge it and i think it's trying hard great you know i would i would think um one thing i often notice in the ways that wikipedia is discussed is that it's um you know, I think I think there are two fundamental ways to look at it, and I think a lot of the world tends to look at Wikipedia as first and foremost as a as an editorial product, as an encyclopedia. It calls itself an encyclopedia, right? And Wikipedia is uh, it, it is certainly, I would say it's certainly a success as an encyclopedia. It's uh, you know it's credited with with basically knocking the Encyclopedia Britannica, sort of the the classic encyclo encyclopedia, out of print. You know, it had such an impact that it messed up its business model. Um, you know, it certainly has has done a lot. It, it has accomplished a lot in terms of what we would expect from an encyclopedia. But to me, I think that's actually kind of the secondary consideration with Wikipedia. I think the the thing that's really revolutionary about Wikipedia is that it has provided a platform, un, kind of similar to social media, but much much better than social media for people all over the world to come together in pursuit of the truth, right? You know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, often we have, it's like my narrative against yours and there's no mechanism whatsoever for trying to come to consensus. People talk about sort of the echo chamber effect, you know, that, uh, or filter bubbles that you tend to hear from people on social media that have similar views to yourself. And so it just reinforces what you're already inclined to think. Wikipedia as a basic premise says like, here is one, we, we have one place to tell the story about this topic. And when there are different views, we've got to weave a narrative that incorporates those different views. Some articles do better than others. You know, some, some individuals do better than others. But I think the importance of that project and a platform that, that makes it possible for us to do it I think that's the biggest impact of Wikipedia, much more than any big collection of words uh, could be, because we've all we've already had big collections of words before. Uh, but something that built that allows us to interact with each other in this way, that I think is brand new with Wikipedia. I think it's going to be hard to follow that answer, Pete. I think you just sort of brought us to a standstill. <laughs> Mic drop. All right. Well, I, I think we probably have uh, have six other people here who are capable of their own mic drops, but maybe we've heard a few of them along the way. Um, so yeah, so let's, uh, let's end this section. Thank you so much to the audience for your questions. I want to make a couple of quick acknowledgments as well. Um, in addition to our speakers, um, we have, so Lane is going to help out with the, uh, the Wiki Dojo. Um, and uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, David Boville and uh, Inger Meta Stenzeth, who are two friends from the Federated Wiki world who were hugely influential in just getting this going uh, and who put together related events themselves around Wikipedia's birthday. Um, and also uh, my brother, Nicholas Boudreau, uh, did the image that's on the, the park bench image that's on our page. And he turned that around 
in I think less than 24 hours. Uh, and I, I, I just love it. I, I hope you all do too. I think it sort of captures the, the, the sort of spirit of, of fun and informality that we were going for with this. Uh, and I'm glad that we were able to bring such, uh, such great ideas together in a session like this. So let's break for, um, let's say until 10 minutes past the hour. And then we'll come back and we'll do the Wiki Dojo session. And unfortunately, if you're watching on YouTube, we're not planning to stream the Wiki Dojo live uh, because we're going to be asking audience members to uh, to make contributions on the fly, and we don't want to put anyone in a position where it's automatically going up there. We we may uh, post it or post excerpts from it to YouTube after the fact. So thank you for everyone for attending, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing those of you on Zoom in ten minutes. And I'm going to end the recording now.